Good afternoon. My name is Palina Sadovska. I'm the Eurasia Program Director at Pan America. And I welcome you all to the event which we called Human Rights in Crisis, Belarus 2022. Together with the permanent mission of Lithuania and Human Rights House Foundation, and over 30 NGOs and states who co-sponsored this event, we invite you to this discussion aimed at analyzing the main trends and developments pertaining to human rights in Belarus, especially after the constitutional referendum. This event will also include a focus on the deterioration of freedom of expression and social and cultural rights in Belarus. The event is a side event to the 50th session of the UN Human Rights Council, which started yesterday in Geneva. To begin with, I would like to set up a few housekeeping rules. First, this event will be recorded. Later, you will be able to find it on the YouTube channels of both Pan America and the Human Rights House Foundation. Also, interpretation is available to or from Russian. Uh, you just need to click on the uh, little globe uh, in the bottom menu to choose your language. During the Q&A segment of this event, co-sponsors, NGOs and states will be invited to take the floor first. Please use the raise your hand function and then also specify who is taking the floor in the chat box. Before we start, I'll just say a few words about this event. Since the holding of the sham election in August 2020, the level of human rights violations in Belarus has only increased. Based on information provided by the Human Rights Center of Yasna at the end of this May, there were more than 100 media organizations shut down, blocked, declared extremists, or targeted by other means. More than 650 NGOs have been formally liquidated or compelled to self-liquidate. According to Pan America's Freedom to Write Index 2021, last year was the second year in a row when Belarus was among the top 10 jailers of writers in the world. The latest report by Pan Belarus states that last year, the number of cultural rights violations was 2.5 times higher than the number recorded in 2020, 1,455 compared to 593 respectively. They also confirmed that to date, out of more than a thousand political prisoners in Belarus, almost a hundred are cultural figures and 28 are journalists. While the number of human rights violations is growing in Belarus, the attention paid by the international community is fading. The full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia on February 24 has not only obscured human rights suffering in Belarus, but formulated new false narratives attributing blame to Belarusian people. Rumors are circulating that the people of Belarus are responsible for the involvement of the Belarusian government in the war. Pan America has seen many instances of Belarusian artists forced to flee their country only to be later denied support from the international organizations on the basis of their nationality. This must be stopped. We're going to hear about more details on what is happening in Belarus from our speakers. But before they begin, I want to highlight that Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Belarus, Anais Mahan, will be presenting her latest report in front of the 30, 50th session of the Human Rights Council on June 28th. In this report, the Special Rapporteur pays particular attention to analysis of the constitutional reform in Belarus, noting the immediate negative and potentially far-reaching consequences of some of the newly adopted provisions of the Constitution. This event aims to make a case on the necessity of the extension of the mandate of a special rapporteur, and I hope that the mandate will be renewed when the Human Rights Council votes later this month. Before introducing our panel, we will hear brief opening remarks from the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, followed by the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, and finally by the US Ambassador to the UN Human Rights Council. Please welcome. Excellencies. Let me bring sincere apologies from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, Gabrielus Landsbergis, who was very keen to participate in, at today's event, but had to be involved in another urgent meeting. It is my great honor to welcome you today at this event dedicated to the issue of human rights crisis in Belarus. We are proud to thank Mr. Imon Gilmore, the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights, Ms. Michelle Taylor, Ambassador of the United States of America to the UN Human Rights Council, as well as each and all of the highly honorable panelists, Dr. Anais Marin, 
Ms. Tatiana Nyadbay, Mr. Alek Aheyev, Ms. Svetlana Alexievich, Ms. Olga Tokarchuk, Ms. Margaret Atwood, Mr. Valery Kowalewski, Mr. Matthew Jones, and of course the moderator, Ms. Polina Sadowska, Eurasia Program Director at Pan American. Today's discussion is organized in cooperation with the NGOs Pan America and Human Rights House Foundation. It is supported by numerous co-sponsors, the European Union and its all member states, Australia, Canada, Iceland, Japan, Liechtenstein, Norway, Ukraine, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. I wish to thank the NGOs, Article 19, International Bar Association, and International Federation for Human Rights for the support and the experts from Permanent Missions in Geneva for joining us. Today, I invite for a look at the human rights situation in Belarus in the broader context. We have to begin from individual level of every person in Belarus tragedy. People of Belarus are facing restrictions, repressions, living in fear, being silenced after a peaceful anti-war demonstration supporting Ukraine. Belarusian authorities continue destroying lives with far-reaching consequences for the generations to come. This cannot be ignored or unnoticed. On the national level, we find systematic destruction of NGOs and civic space, ruining the judicial system and any prerequisites for democratic institutions. Number of political prisoners increased to more than 1,200. Lithuania condemns repressions by the Lukashenko regime against all groups of society, human rights defenders, journalists, media workers, and once again calls for the immediate release of all political prisoners and their full rehabilitation. We condemn arbitrary arrests and detentions, enforced disappearances, sexual and gender-based violence, and torture of the members of civil society. Recent amendment to the Criminal Code of Belarus, introducing death penalty for attempted acts of terrorism raises serious concerns. It opens the possibility for further abuse since many political prisoners have already been charged or condemned to long prison terms under the code's terrorism provisions. On the regional level, we witnessed large-scale hybrid attack by the Belarusian authorities instrumentalizing migrants and refugees from the third countries, aiming to exert political pressure and destabilize the situation in the EU countries. There are also serious consequences of Belarus regime allowing Russian Federation to use its territory to attack Ukraine, acting as an accomplice, raising the level of threat to the region. Finally, on the international level, impunity enjoyed by the Belarusian regime continues to reign because of a lack of effective international mechanisms of accountability. We must persist in demanding adequate response. In this regard, Lithuania expresses its resolute support for international accountability mechanisms to make sure that the perpetrators of human rights violations in Belarus will be brought to justice. We strongly support the examination mandate of the OHCHR. We would like to stress the important role of, of the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Belarus. Even after 10 years of operation, this mandate remains relevant. We would like to express our deepest gratitude to Dr. Anais Marin for her work, dedication, professionalism, true concern, willingness, and readiness to contribute and make real change. We look forward to the presentation of the report in the Human Rights Council 50th session and strongly advocate for the renewal of the mandate. Excellencies, Lithuania, together with the co-sponsors of today's event, continues to support Belarusian civil society, including NGOs, journalists, and other media workers, human rights defenders, and activists. What more can we do? to show all those suffering from repressions and especially the political prisoners that they are not forgotten and to tell the stories of regime's victims. To make sure that Lukashenko's regime feels constant pressure to stop repressions against its own people, to release political prisoners and to respect the principles of human rights. To place the issue of accountability at the core of all our actions and initiatives aimed at protecting human rights. The regime must know that its abuse of power Violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms will not go unpunished. Excellencies, I wish all of us an interesting discussion and I thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
It is my pleasure to join you virtually today for this important discussion on the human rights crisis in Belarus and to deliver opening remarks alongside His Excellency Gabrielius Landsbergis, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, and Her Excellency Michelle Taylor, US Ambassador to the UN Human Rights Council. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation of human rights in Belarus continues to deteriorate. The scale of repression is worse than ever before. The number of political prisoners, now at 1,237, rose by almost 30% since the end of 2021. Over 650 civil society organisations have been closed down or are in the process of forced liquidation. The February constitutional referendum served no other purpose but to further consolidate Lukashenko's authoritarian power. And the recent change to the criminal code, enlarging the scope for the use of the death penalty, paves the way for further serious abuses against democratic forces that the regime calls terrorist. Not to mention the complicity of Lukashenko's regime in enabling and supporting the Russian military aggression against Ukraine, which raises many further human rights concerns, such as those for Belarusian activists, human rights defenders and journalists who in the past had been forced to flee to Ukraine, hoping to find a safe haven, and now are forced to flee again. The EU has been in the forefront of addressing the human rights crisis in Belarus, including in international fora, and we will continue to do so. At the 49th session of the Human Rights Council, the EU presented a resolution to renew the mandate of the High Commissioner for one year. This enabled the Commissioner to continue examining human rights violations committed in Belarus since the 1st of May 2020, collecting and analysing evidence with a view to bringing justice for victims and to holding perpetrators to account. This work proceeds well. Robust evidence now exists for thousands of serious human rights violations. These efforts are complementary to the vital work carried out by the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Belarus, whose mandate is to study the human rights environment and to make recommendations for its improvement. Against the backdrop of the raging human rights crisis in Belarus, it is crucial to maintain both the accountability mechanism and the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. I look forward to working with you in this endeavour and especially to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you for organising this important event. As Russia's unprovoked and brutal invasion of Ukraine has consumed the world's attention, we remind this body that we cannot forget the intensifying internal repression in Belarus. The people of Ukraine are fighting authoritarianism as they defend their democracy, freedom, and respect for their human rights. The people of Belarus, no less, are fighting authoritarianism in pursuit of these same principles. As President Biden announced last year, the United States will hold individuals to account for their roles in attacks on democracy and human rights and for acts of corruption and transnational repression. The United States condemns the Lukashenko regime's increasingly brutal repression, including its efforts to intimidate the pro-democracy movement and those who oppose Russia's war in Ukraine, and Belarus's actions to facilitate that war. This repression has only intensified since the sham constitutional referendum earlier this year that was designed to strengthen Lukashenko's grip on power. Indeed, the regime recently amended the criminal code to allow for the use of the death penalty against individuals convicted of, quote, attempted acts of terrorism. It has been using this tactic to silence opposition voices. We condemn the regime's fabrication of politically motivated charges of, quote, extremism and terrorism, end quote, against many of the more than 1,200 political prisoners it unjustly holds and against tens of thousands more it is unjustly detained. We call for their immediate release. We are deeply disturbed by the increasingly lengthy prison sentences for those unjustly held, such as political prisoner Vyacheslav Malaychuk, sentenced to 22 years imprisonment in a high security penal colony on fabricated charges of, quote, terrorism. The United States stands with the people of Belarus 
who over the past two years have continued to stand up for their rights in the face of brutal authoritarianism, often at grave personal cost. The Belarusian people have demonstrated time and time again that the regime cannot silence their calls for democracy. Only a national dialogue inclusive of civil society and of the democratic movement will lead Belarus out of its current political stalemate into a future democratic and prosperous Belarus. Thank you. Thank you, Lithuania, the EU, and the US for these remarks. I now turn to the first of our panelists, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Belarus, Anais Maran. Madam Special Rapporteur, let me first express my gratitude for your participation. I would like to once again reiterate the importance for the Human Rights Council and the international community to support the extension of your mandate during the current session. I would like to ask you to describe how the situation with human rights in Belarus has changed since uh, you last updated the Human Rights Council earlier this year. Madam Special Rapporteur, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Polina. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here in my capacity as Special Rapporteur. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together this topical and timely event. Whereas the world's attention is focused on the war in Ukraine, Belarus, I believe, deserves no lesser attention, given that the human rights situation there continues to deteriorate. My report to the current session of the Human Rights Council is already public, but I will present it on 28th of June at the Interactive Dialogue. Today, what I can share with you are the main highlights of my findings and recommendations concerning our topic for this event, freedom of expression and cultural rights. Let me remind that sadly, the implementation of my mandate continues to be limited due to the lack of cooperation and engagement of the Belarusian authorities. As in previous years, and despite repeated requests, the government did not grant me access to the country. Therefore, I continue to rely on remote monitoring based on testimonies from victims uh, of human rights violations, on reports from reliable sources, notably from human rights defenders, as well as on other relevant sources of information, including publicly available official ones. Building on this comprehensive analysis, I can objectively say that the situation has been going from bad to worse, notably as regards freedom of opinion and their expression. The human rights situation in Belarus, which has long been unsatisfactory, further deteriorated over the past year, a trend which continues up to this day. The already repressive laws have been further tightened to prevent and punish any actual or perceived scrutiny of the government and to repress debate with a devastating impact on freedom of the media and cultural rights. Let me remind of three extremely worrying trends in the legislative field. First, freedom of peaceful assembly has been further restricted. The administrative code establishes an authorization process for assemblies, which is contrary to international human rights standards. New administrative provisions impose harsher fines and longer detention terms up to 30 days for the organization of unauthorized assemblies or participation in them. Furthermore, criminal liability has been introduced for a repeated procedural violation. And if the organizer is acting in the name of an unregistered organization, this prevents gatherings, not only of peaceful protesters who oppose the government, which since the fall of 2020 have moved online mostly due to the harsh repression which they were met with throughout 2020. In fact, restrictions target cultural events as well, including one person performances, and they keep expanding into the virtual sphere of the internet too, where the simple fact of announcing an event before it has been formally authorized exposes to liability. Second, freedom of opinion and expression have been further curtailed by harshening the criminalization of defamation or insult of the country, government officials or the president, which carries a sentence of up to five years in prison. This is not only contrary to international human rights standards, any criminal penalties or excessive civil penalties for defamation are generally inconsistent with Article 19 of the ICCPR. It also has a chilling effect on media freedoms, academic freedoms and cultural rights. In fact, over the past two years, dozens of journalists, bloggers, writers, musicians and artists have faced intimidation, threats and repression up to criminal prosecution in what appears to me as a witch hunt meant to silence or force into exile all possible dissenters. 
A third worrying trend is the significant expansion of the law on countering extremism, which now covers a wide range of non-specific terms and vaguely defined acts, allowing for a broad interpretation of what can be deemed as extremist material. The creators, organizers, and members of groups labeled as extremists can face up to seven years in prison. By now, most independent Belarusian media outlets are considered extremist, 29, as compared to only one before the uh, 2020 election. The list also includes 588 social media channels and blogs. There were only a dozen on that list two years ago. This is severely limiting the distribution of material related to culture as well, and duly interfering with the legitimate exercise of the right to freedom of opinion. Excellencies, the year 2021 and the first half of 2022 were marked by an unprecedented wave of persecution of journalists and media workers, and the virtual annihilation of independent media as part of a wider crackdown which appears to be geared towards purging civil society from all the elements which are not to the authorities liking. More than 60 media representatives have faced criminal prosecution and 28 remain in pretrial detention or are serving long jail sentences, according to the Belarusian Association of Journalists itself forced to dissolve last year. Editorial offices had to close or move abroad while close to 400 NGOs have been forced to dissolve and participation in the activities of non-registered or forcedly dissolved organizations has become criminalized. As a result, the country has lost at least 98 organizations directly related to the sphere of culture, according to Pen Belarus. Lastly, I must underline that impunity for human rights violations continue to prevail in Belarus which illustrates the necessity for the international community and for my mandate to continue supporting the OHCHR accountability mechanism established under the mandate of the High Commissioner. As torture and ill treatment reportedly continue on a systematic basis in places of detention in Belarus, I hope that the mechanism will contribute to accountability for perpetrators and granting justice to the victims. Meanwhile, the need remains to protect victims and witnesses and their relatives whether in Belarus or abroad, since as a result of repression or intimidation, hundreds of thousands of Belarusians have been forced to seek refuge abroad over the past two years. That will actually be the focus of my forthcoming report to the General Assembly. The continuous crackdown on civil society, which I document in uh, my 2020 report to the Human Rights Council, has justified our decision to name as few sources as possible to avoid exposing them to the risk of reprisals. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of widespread international condemnation, the government of Belarus has continued its policy of systemic and systematic reprisals against human rights defenders, journalists and media workers, writers, cultural workers, and other members of the civil society who are active in the civic space. Such actions prevent their meaningful participation in public life, the sharing of information on matters of public concern, and hence impair on freedom of expression and the realization of rights to culture. It is therefore of utmost importance that UN member states <clears throat> adopt a principled, coordinated and consistent approach oriented to enhancing the protection and promotion of human rights, preserving, preserving and strengthening the civic space and reestablishing the rule of law in Belarus. I am convinced that the attention of the, to the situation of human rights in Belarus needs to be maintained, notwithstanding the focus on the war in Ukraine and its regional consequences. I hope that my reports will support UN member states in reassessing their engagement with the authorities of Belarus in the current context. Given the extent and scale of continuing human rights challenges in Belarus, I believe my mandate remains critical for independent monitoring and reporting on the situation. I will continue to engage with and support the efforts of civil society and human rights organizations, as well as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to enhance respect for and protection of human rights in Belarus until tangible progress in the area of human rights is achieved. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Madam Special Rapporteur, uh, I'm looking forward to, to see you, the presentation of your report on June 28th. Um, now I turn to the Executive Director and Vice President of PAN Belarus, Tatiana Nyadbai. 
Since the crisis of 2020, Pan Belarus has been instrumental in bringing attention to the increasing number of cultural rights violations and violations of rights of cultural figures in Belarus. They have also offered emergency support to writers, artists, and cultural managers directly affected by their artistic position, all while navigating the organization's survival as one of the 600 plus human rights organizations liquidated in Belarus and forced to relocate. Ms. Nidbay, please share with us how the situation changed for the cultural community in Belarus in the last year, maybe specifically in the last month since the beginning of the Russian war in Ukraine. Ms. Nidbay, you have the floor. Добрый день всем. Спасибо большое за возможность сказать несколько слов о Беларуси и о культурном секторе в Беларуси. Hello everyone, thank you very much for giving me the floor to tell you about Belarus and uh, about this segment. Today the war in Ukraine is often on the top of the world's agenda. It's absolutely right. It should be this way. The world admires the courage of Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are fighting for all of us. But uh, today I would like to ask you not to forget about Belarus. I'm saying these words not by no means to shift the focus away from Ukraine. No, Pan Belarus, as well as the entire civil society of Belarus, which managed to survive abroad, has been involved in helping Ukraine since the first days of the war. And the uh, bidding of a number of reasons, we perfectly understand of what is needed uh, to Ukraine, and we understand uh, what support we needed uh, back uh, then and what support we need today. And we also perfectly remember the wave of solidarity that turned uh, towards Belarus and we express our gratitude this way Thirdly, we understand that uh, the fate of the region and even the world is now being decided in Ukraine. But my country is a part of this war. Uh, in 2020, the people of uh, Belarus uh, came out uh, in peaceful protest against uh, stolen elections and violence, and uh, it was uh, all, uh, uh, all the things uh, that happened in 2020 by the government, it was to prepare for the invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine, but it was not only the problem of stolen elections, or not only the problem of Belarus, but it is a problem for all Europe. Back then, neither we nor Europe nor the whole world could stop Lukashenko. Could uh, we could not stop uh, the uh, the regime of Putin, uh, like we were not able to do it uh, back in 2014 when there was the aggression in Ukraine. We were not able to do it in Georgia in 2008, uh, nor in Chechnya earlier. Today, Belarus is a territory occupied by Russia. Lukashenko today is uh, uh, the master of the Belarusian concentration camp controlled by Russia. Uh, the same uh, Russia wants to do uh, in Ukraine, to transform Ukraine into the same concentration camp controlled, loyal and pro-Russian. After the initial shock uh, that the hot phase of the war uh, was finally deciding, I thought about Belarusian political prisoners. And today, uh, there are uh, 1,230. Thank you to Vyasna, to the partners, for keeping the statistics. 1,230 political prisoners who are uh, in, in uh, prisons in horrible conditions, and uh, uh, probably they will be neglected around the world today. Uh, according to international human rights uh, organizations, uh, the conditions uh, and environment where people stay are inhumane. This is torture. People have been rotting in prisons for years, literally. Over 40,000 people have been detained since the beginning of the 2020 election campaign protests. Out of uh, 1,230 political prisons, uh, 79 are cultural figures, and uh, 31 of them are writers. The cultural sector of Belarus is under very strong influence of the Russian cultural dispute, and this is actually suppressed by the Russian world. Everything national is destroyed in Belarus. The same thing we can see in Ukraine, when in the occupied territories they burn down Ukrainian books and they exterminate Ukrainian culture. In the middle of May, uh, Andrei Inoshkevich and the literature observer and uh, um, employer of the publishing house, Nasa Karnanskaya, were detained. Uh, they uh, continued publishing Belarusian books in the Belarus concentration camp. That was the reason. It's a European country where for the books in Belarusian language or uh, for the pin in black, red and white colors or in uh, yellow and blue colors, you can be called an extremist because extremism this is whatever which is not in line with the official propaganda and ideology. 
today, today we have information uh, that out of the libraries of Belarus, they uh, recall uh, books uh, of Belarusian writers, over 30 writers before that, uh, George Orwell's book uh, 1984 uh, was uh, prohibited for publishing in Belarus. Belarusians have been fighting for two years, but unlike uh, Ukraine, which resists the aggression together with their, pres uh, with their president, uh, Belarusians are fighting both the regime and uh, whatever is brought in by Russia. I'm not uh, here to horrify or scare you away to uh, to just decide the figures, but I would like to use this opportunity to ask you about a few things. Please do not drop Belarus from your agenda. Keep it in your focus. Put it alongside your Ukrainian priorities. Many Belarusians, including writers, cultural figures, are outside Belarus. I do understand that uh, supporting culture of the other country is really a priority for politicians in various countries, but they do need your support. The situation in which we are in is a marathon. It continues uh, since 2020, and there is no end to it. Belarusian writers who uh, were forced to relocate from Belarus are not safe to get back. They need your support. Please do not abandon them and support others. If they are forced to come back to Belarus, then all we can do for them is just making another statement con uh, condemning their detention, nothing else. And another problem we have been facing since the war outbreak is discrimination. Many institutions have stopped cooperating with the citizens of Belarus because the territory of Belarus has been used to attack Ukraine. This discrimination uh, has already affected the Belarusian uh, culture figures, but the not Belarusians are launching these details and uh, not Belarusian writers who are against the war. Svetlana Alexievich, uh, who was not able to be with us today because of her illness, uh, who is uh, 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 outside the country, uh, uh, was called to the German bank to find out whether she was a Russian or a Belarusian. I know that in uh, this uh, meeting, nobody needs to be convinced that discrimination because of nationality or by password is unacceptable. But I would like to request that you use your leverage and authority to counteract this discrimination. Belarusians, just like Russians who fight against the empire and speak out against the war, shall not be expelled from support programs, scholarships, conferences and festivals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Nidwai. And to strengthen Ms. Nidwai's points, I invite you to listen to a recorded message by the award-winning Canadian poet, novelist, and environmental activist, Margaret Atwood, whose Belarusian translator, Volga Kalatske, has been under two trials on spurious charges since August 2020, and is currently under so-called Hemia house arrest in Minsk. Please listen to Margaret Atwood. Hello, my name is Margaret Atwood. I'm a writer, and Volga Kalitskaya is my Belarusian translator, and she is in political difficulties in her country. This is a letter from her that I'm reading. Orwell's 1984 has been banned by the Belarusian regime. What is it doing if not pleading guilty? Yes, Belarus is, is a dystopia where war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Andrei Yanushkovich, a publisher who has produced a great many books of modern Belarusian literature, and his employee Nasta Karnaskaya have been behind bars since the 16th of May. Yet what is it compared to the deaths of over 260 Ukrainian children killed by the Russian invaders? My friend Mark Bernstein, the Wikipedia contributor who wrote an article about Russia's aggression against Ukraine, is awaiting trial. So is Katerina Andrevia, the Belsat journalist and my cellmate, absurdly charged with high treason. They are just two of more than 1,300 political prisoners in Belarus, including about 100 cultural workers. The numbers are steadily rising. Yet what is it compared to the tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians killed in the war? Most of my friends and colleagues have been thrown into prison or forced to flee the country 
like hundreds of thousands of Lukashenko's other opponents. Yet what is it compared to the millions of Ukrainian refugees whose homes were shelled and bombed by the Russian military? On 24th of February, the Lukashenko regime allowed Russia to launch an offensive on Ukraine from Belarus. Even though we did not elect the dictator and have no voice in Belarus at all, the mere idea of my country being a co-aggressor makes me scream with shame and pain as in Edvard Munch's painting. Yet what is it compared to the screams of the Ukrainian people whose cities and towns have been raised by missiles launched from Belarus? Deeply wounded and traumatized, the victims are willing to steer clear of everything that reminds them of this horrendous trauma, including Belarusian culture and those who speak for it. It is only natural that all Belarusians are now being associated with the current regime, implicated in co-aggression, even those who have always fought against it. When your neighbors are hit by a wall, the last thing you can expect from them is to know a hawk from a heron in the picture on the wall that hit them. I mean, it would be wishful thinking to imagine that the contrast between Lukashenko and his ruthlessly silenced opponents still matters to the Ukrainians. Yet we scream with your pain. We weep for Buch, Busha and Mariupol. We pray for Severodonetsk and Lyskoshensk. We believe in the Ukrainian armed forces. We stand with you. We sing with you. O Uluzi Chervona Kolinya. Please, if you can, don't silence us. Thank you, Ms. Atwood and uh, uh, Ms. Kalatska. Um, our thoughts are with you, Volga. Um, now I would like to welcome Ali Khaev, uh, Deputy Director of Belarusian Association of Journalists, Baj. According to Baj, at the moment, uh, there are 28 journalists behind bars in Belarus. So could you please describe the situation with media freedoms in the country in the last months? Mr. Khaev, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Happy to greet all colleagues. It's true that under conditions when in our region of Eastern Europe, there is war happening of Russia against Ukraine and when the role of Belarus causes uh, no doubts in this war. The situation of politically motivated persecution in Belarus, the situation of political prisoners in Belarus, and persecution for freedom of expression is what the Belarusian civil society needs badly. First of all, I appreciate the work of Anais Maron over these years, documenting information and uh, updating international community as well as institutions of UN, which is very important. And I understand that it is only the fault of Belarusian authorities who preclude uh, Madame Maron from uh, attending Belarus. We have to count with these restrictions, but I fully share her findings and uh, they really reflect the human rights situation, including freedom of expression and the pressure upon independent media occurring now in Belarus. This is true. And it has been said repeatedly today that there are journalists who are designated as political prisoners in Belarus for performing their duty and for freedom of expression. Yesterday, there were 28 of them. As of today, we are aware of one more journalist who was uh, arrested yesterday in the evening and searched. And for his journalism, today he is also detained. Fortunately, the monitoring of our organization shows that repressions against journalists and uh, media sector are enduring. Entire a range of um, possibilities are used uh, to silence any dissent. 
there are different occasions that they use one for freedom of expression or for working in independent media a person can either be prosecuted for tax evasion starting with this article all down to the high tr treason and um, basically the entire range of criminal code is exploited for political persecution and the situation is made worse by the fact that the mechanisms that are intended to defend such as independent courts and independent prosecutors or any other institutions which would enable effective remedy in belarus they are absent and the bodies that exist under these names in state institutions are merely links in the same chain of the political prosecution. Defending, protecting someone in Belarus from political motivation is impossible in today's Belarus, which resulted in entire group of uh, media, media workers and journalists leaving Belarus. Currently, there are hundreds and hundreds of journalists who have left Belarus. Some editorial teams have uh, left in corpora, while others only relocated the most uh, sensitive uh, journalists to prosecution, such as media managers. Well, journalists stay in the mode of working underground in occupied territory. I understand that legally, if the term of occupation is not applicable to the situation of Belarus. However, the reality of people who live there, they really are, and they have this exact feeling of people who operate in occupied territories including those occupied by russia and ukraine and even the interviews which the belarusian association of journalists conduct with um, the people who have already served their criminal services show that as tatiana netbay has said having been placed in prison in belarus means um, withstanding detention conditions that amount to torture and uh, a number of other crimes against humanity committed by the Belarusian regime as uh, over previous years have been documented as of today. And I support the idea that the mandate of special rapporteur on human rights situation in Belarus is an uh, effective tool today. And in the current situation, it has, it has to be extended. And I propose to all stakeholders to do every effort to make sure this mandate is prolonged because this is one of the voices which enable to keep Belarus on the agenda of the international community and to update it on rightful information from uh, all perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Mr. Ahiv. Um, I just would like to um, uh, add uh, that the journalist uh, that was detained yesterday, his name is uh, Evgeny Yerchak, he's a photographer. Um, with this, I would like to turn it over to a number of respondents. We'll start with Valery Kavalevsky, head of the Cabinet of Belarus Opposition Leader Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Pavel Sapelka, lawyer of the Human Rights Center of Yes Now Will Follow, and Matthew Jones, international advocacy officer of the Human Rights House Foundation, will go next. So, Mr. Kowalewski, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Lovska, and many thanks to the permanent mission of Lithuania, uh, to Pan America and Human Rights House Foundation uh, for organizing this very timely and very focused event uh, on the events in Belarus, and to all those friends of Belarus who have supported this discussion. As I've been listening uh, to this conversation, uh, to the contributions from, uh, from the speakers, I've felt how much humbled I am uh, to, to be with you, uh, to speak about Belarus. And thanks to your strength, thanks to your dedication, the world knows about the humanitarian catastrophe in Belarus. Uh, as we speak, the situation in Belarus has not changed for the best. Uh, if anything, it has deteriorated significantly. And we can see now that the repressions uh, have been directly proportionate uh, to the resistance of the society, which gives us both uh, the uh, material to, uh, to analyze uh, the, uh, the pattern of these repressions, but also hope that the Belarusian society is not giving up uh, in spite of all the pressure, of all the brutality and lawlessness, uh, Belarusians continue to protest. They continue to, to demand uh, the democratic change in our country. 
At the same time, I would uh, uh, sign with uh, uh, Tatiana, uh, who spoke about the uh, the outcry that has been there for quite a while when we spoke about the events in Belarus that could lead uh, to turning uh, this regime into a threat to international peace and security. And this is exactly what we have seen uh, in 2021 and this year uh, from Ryan Air hijacking to the migration uh, crisis orchestrated by Lukashenko to punish EU uh, to finally the war against Ukraine in which Lukashenko participates as a co-aggressor. Uh, at the same time, repressions uh, uh, against Belarusians uh, have devolved uh, into the war of, of aggression, and we can see now that the repressions uh, inside the country, they now have essentially two tracks uh, to, to punish the people uh, for, uh, for their uh, longing for democratic change, but also for their support of, of the Ukrainian people uh, amidst this aggression. Uh, as, as it was uh, mentioned already, there's been a number of administrative arrests uh, in the month of May alone, uh, 263 arrests, uh, which is accompanied by torture in the places of de detention and treatment uh, in prisons, uh, in the penal colonies of all those who already been uh, sentenced to, uh, to prison terms. Uh, in addition to that, we can see now uh, additional patterns uh, in the behavior of, uh, of Lukashenko, who has made uh, some really bold steps uh, in essentially uh, disseminating uh, uh, apologies uh, in destroying completely the trade unions uh, movement starting with the arrests of the key figures and now just a couple of days ago it was uh, uh, the step has been made to liquidate uh, all those independent trade unions that have been functioning until now in addition to that we can see that uh, the regime has instituted uh, change uh, in legislation uh, to to expand the interpretation of, uh, of terrorism, uh, essentially making it uh, uh, an effective tool of, uh, uh, of uh, scaring people from away from the protest, away from the civil society activities. Uh, so what kind of steps uh, can we make now uh, in this environment and what we are making uh, in the uh, democratic movement uh, jointly with the uh, civil society actors? Uh, we need to increase support uh, for human rights defenders, we need to increase support for the media, for civil society, but also to those uh, who are directly involved uh, in advancing and protecting cultural rights. And uh, in this regard, I would like to mention a successful exercise that we have just finished uh, together with the European Union. We have analyzed needs assessment uh, of the civil society field uh, in Belarus, and uh, it's been adopted with one specific category of uh, uh, dedicated to Support, supporting cultural uh, initiatives uh, in Belarus. Uh, since we see what's, what's happening right now in Belarus, and for quite some time actually, is that Lukashenko's regime has been deliberately destroying the cultural field, cultural community, which is the core, intellectual core of the nation, the soul of the nation. And uh, this, is, this is the area that needs additional support. Uh, we also need to, to take additional care for political prisoners and members of their families. Uh, because lack of this support on a continuous basis uh, essentially begets fear of abandonment uh, among people, uh, especially those who are left in Belarus, uh, who are still there, who are still fighting. Uh, and this also leads uh, lack of this support, lack of this attention, uh, at least to the feeling of isolation and withdrawal, and we need to beat it. Uh, it is also important now, uh, since the war started, uh, to to address in practical sphere and by practical steps uh, the cases of discrimination and the stigmatization of Belarusians and help with the mobility of Belarusians in the European Union uh, and in other countries that can be helpful uh, to, to our cause. Uh, also, an important area for us to work uh, for the democratic forces, for Svetlana Tsikhanovska in particular, uh, is to bring additional attention of the international organizations to the situation in Belarus. I would like to mention uh, one case uh, that we're working hard right now on, and this is uh, to, uh, to institutionalize presence of Belarus uh, in, in the Council of Europe. Uh, this would bring us uh, tracks uh, to two tracks, important tracks uh, for, uh, for the future Belarus. And this is to, uh, to, the, to, to work on the statehood uh, of Belarus, on the state institutions, but also to develop uh, the uh, societal fabric uh, and the uh, office of Svetlana Tsikhanovska works jointly with the stakeholders from the civil society to have this presence continuous and very practical uh, to work on these two tracks. We also want 
to expand our presence in the OSC. So far, this organization has not been uh, quite effective uh, in addressing the situation in Belarus. Its mechanisms have been uh, essentially sleeping. We want to wake them up. I uh, want to expand our presence. Uh, we've already had uh, one successful uh, intervention of Svetlana Tsikhanovska uh, in, in the OSC uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Now we are planning such, uh, such engagements uh, in the OSC Parliamentary Assembly in Birmingham. Uh, finally, the United Nations. Uh, we want to uh, to make an effort uh, to bring this uh, this situation in Belarus uh, to the third committee, uh, probably by invoking the country specific resolution, essentially to uh, to bring uh, the situation in Belarus uh, to the attention of the entire world. We need a global poll on what is what the world is thinking about Belarus, Belarus and uh, the regime of Lukashenko. Uh, finally, it's very important uh, to to keep uh, uh, to keep running these two important uh, uh, mechanisms uh, in the Human Rights Council, the examination team that has just been uh, prolonged uh, for another year uh, in March, uh, but also a special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Belarus is very important, uh, and the situation in in Belarus proves it that this mechanism is very much needed. And so we call for your support uh, to continue uh, to continue this mandate. And finally. One last point uh, that has already been mentioned here is that Belarus and Ukraine are very much interconnected. Our fates are together. Uh, it is impossible to imagine Belarus that is free and independent and uh, uh, democratic without Ukraine being successful in this war. Similarly, it is impossible to imagine that Ukraine is, uh, uh, is sovereign, it has uh, its identity and its sovereign choice. Uh, if Belarus continues to be under the control of Lukashenko, who is controlled uh, in his turn by Putin. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kowalewski. Um, I would like to remind our co-sponsors and everyone who wishes to speak to use the raise your hand function and indicate in the chat uh, who is going to speak. We'll turn to Q&A section soon. Next is Pavel Sapelka, lawyer of the Human Rights Center of Yasna. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. In fact, I would like to note that the situation in Belarus is the outcome of a multi-year suppression of political and civil society activity. And this was at the top in 2020, when dozens of thousands of people have found themselves under repressions and uh, at least 5,000 uh, victims of torture and uh, torture treatment uh, was, uh, were, were identified and uh, uh, the perpetrators have not been punished. There were uh, several people who were killed and uh, 1,230 people are political prisoners today. The efforts of the regime have been focused on exterminating the civil society and uh, the spots of uh, political protest and to suppress the freedom of speech. In fact, uh, the, uh, the Belarusians have always been pushed away from the governance process. And uh, today, the majority of these people are forced to be outside of the country. And my recommendation is to ensure uh, that uh, the, these people are engaged in the activities of international organizations to continue supporting uh, those organizations that are the voices of the Belarusian society, in particular the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska. It should be noted uh, that uh, since the 1990s, the democratic opposition and activists uh, were consistent uh, in supporting the sovereignty of Belarus, warning about uh, the uh, risky dependence on Russia. At the same time, political economic support uh, uh, of uh, the two uh, dictator regimes uh, was translated into the open aggression of uh, Russia against Ukraine. Political democratic uh, forces uh, condemned uh, uh, these actions and today they express uh, uh, their position and those who do they are under additional repression in Belarus. I should note that among 1,230 political prisoners uh, there are seven human rights activists uh, from Vesna Center 
Владимир Влабкович, лоер, Валентин Стефанович, uh, vice president uh, of uh, Vesna, as well as uh, Alias Biliatsky, who is in prison, to, who is the founder and head of Vesna. Marfa Rabkova is in detention. Leonid Sudalenko, Tatiana Jovica, and Andrei Chepik. However, even these measures were not able to stop the political condemnation of Belarusians because they condemned uh, uh, the aggression supported by the Belarusian authorities. Uh, the rough response of Belarusian authorities added hundreds of more victims of torture and repression to the thousands of cases that I've mentioned. In the today's condition, when the tragedy of the Ukrainian people is at the forefront, and uh, which brings attention of all, I call you not uh, to neglect the circumstances which enable the Belarusian authorities, despite the will of the Belarusian people, to support the war. And everything started with uh, the total terror against the Belarusian citizens. And this process continues. I would like uh, to urge you to support the special rapporteur and uh, I urge the international platform IBB that has been established uh, in order to accumulate uh, data on human rights violations in Belarus. Uh, this is the database of uh, international human uh, rights violations and I urge you to support uh, human rights organizations, journalists and activists. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sepelka. Um, Matthew Jones, International Advocacy Officer of the Human Rights House Foundation is next. M Mr. Jones, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Polina. And um, thanks to PEN America and the Permanent Mission of Lithuania for helping to organize this event. Um, colleagues, back in March, we of course received the very strong report of the OHCHR examination of Belarus, which gave us clear details and evidence of the, and I quote, widespread and systematic nature of the human rights violations in Belarus. Um, we've of course heard an update from colleagues today, including the special rapporteur and Belarusian uh, human rights defenders. Sadly, the situation hasn't improved since March. In fact, rather it's continued uh, to deteriorate. Um, if, if you haven't already, I'd really strongly urge colleagues to read the rapporteur's latest report, which is of course available uh, already on the Human Rights Council website. Um, I'd also remind colleagues that those who are subject to human rights violations in Belarus and those who have fled the country don't have currently any effective remedies or a course to justice domestically or regionally. Um, let's remember that Belarus is not a member of the Council of Europe after all. So Belarusians are really looking to the Human Rights Council to continue this process of accountability and to ensure that their voices are heard. Um, we've heard from Pavel and Alek and Tatiana. Um, we've heard uh, of the ongoing concerns of our Vyazna colleagues and the very large numbers of others who were detained and imprisoned in Belarus, including, of course, dozens of journalists. Um, some we know, of course, are struggling to get their needed medical att attention and treatment. So, so what can we do? Um, Valerie, of course, has already outlined some steps. Let me emphasize a few as well, um, because I think there are several things that delegations can do to assist the situation. First, it's already been said, but let me repeat it again. Uh, we need to strongly support the EU-led resolution process that will come before the Human Rights Council this session. We need to ensure that the Special Rapporteur's mandate is renewed. Um, the Special Rapporteur, it goes without saying, but let me repeat it, offers a unique bridge to Belarusian civil society, ensuring they're not forgotten, even as their freedoms are undermined and removed by the authorities. Um, I and, and Human Rights House Foundation have been working with the Special Rapporteur with Belarusian civil society for many years. And, and I can say from strong personal experience that the mandate is very important to Belarusians. Second, read the special rapporteur's report and take part in the interactive dialogue on the 28th of June and encourage other delegations to take part as well. Let's send a really strong message um, uh, to the authorities in Belarus and to our colleagues in Belarus on the 28th of June. Third, 
Delegations need to support and continue to support the work of the OHCHR examination on Belarus. Um, let's ensure that, it's, that it continues to be uh, fully funded and resourced. Um, and that we're cooperating with its staff to ensure they're able to carry out their work independently and with all the tools they need. Fourth, um, as Valerie has already mentioned, let's see that Belarus is raised at the General Assembly this year. Let, let's ensure that our colleagues in New York and that the diplo diplomatic community in New York are fully apprised of the human rights situation um, in Belarus. Fifth and finally, delegations um, need to be assisting Belarusians themselves. Let's look at opportunities to support those in exile, um, as well as those who have remained in the country. And particularly, um, I would say to those delegations that still have a diplomatic presence in Minsk. For instance, um, you know, those who are able, please continue to request to visit those in detention and in prison. HRHF and others, um, including um, all of the NGO co-sponsors of this event can offer further advice in this regard. So please feel free to reach out to us um, after this event um, uh, for further recommendations. I wanna conclude by encouraging us not to give up, echoing uh, Tatiana's words. The, the Belarusian authorities after all are relying on us to lose interest, to walk away. Let's continue to show our strong solidarity with Belarusians and never give up fighting for their rights. Thank you again for the possibility to be part of this event and um, looking forward to working with colleagues uh, throughout the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And thanks to all the panelists to stay on time. Uh, we now invite the co-sponsors of our event, NGOs and states to make your remarks and ask questions. I will shortly turn uh, to Poland for their intervention followed by Ukraine. On behalf of PEN America, the permanent mission of Lithuania and the Human Rights House Foundation, I want to take this moment to thank the many sponsors of today's event. We have more than 30 co-sponsors, so I won't steal the time from the event um, to list them all. But once again, I would like to express our sincere gratitude for your support. Now, Poland, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And I would like to thank the permanent mission of Lithuania, Human Rights House Foundation and Pan America for organizing this, this event on the human rights uh, crisis that is raging in, in Belarus. Uh, colleagues, Poland is extremely concerned by the critical human rights situation in Belarus, a state whose authorities support the Russian military aggression against Ukraine. We are alarmed by the constantly increasing number of political prisoners in the country. Among these political prisoners, there is an eminent member of the Union of Poles in Belarus and journalist Mr. Andrzej Pochobut, arrested since March 2021. Sadly, his case is not the only one confirming repressive policies of Belarusian authorities towards members of Polish national minority not involved in political life of the country. Moreover, the leader of the Union of Poles in Belarus, Ms. Angelika Boris, continues to be persecuted by Belarusian authorities. After spending one year in prison, she remains uh, under the house arrest as charges against her have not been dropped and financial penalty might be imposed upon her. In this context, we are concerned by the accelerated process of suppression of Polish language education in Belarus, strongly affecting the rights of persons belonging to the national minorities. The Belarusian authorities have continued their repressive policies in relation to the Belarusian independent media mass media and journalists by means of the administrative and criminal prosecution, including in the context of Russian aggression against Ukraine. The authorities, uh, authorities suppress the dissemination of unbiased information about the reasons and the course of military actions that were not in line with the official Russian narrative. With regard to the situation of media freedom in Belarus, we welcome UNESCO's decision to award the Belarusian Association of Journalists uh, with the Guillermo Cano World Press Award. Further mobilization of the international community to assist independent journalists and media in Belarus is of pivotal importance for supporting the latter's valuable work. Actions by the Belarusian authorities confirm systemic and continuous denial of human rights in the country and their lack of will to positively engage with the international mechanisms with a view to reverse this dire trend. For these reasons, we stress the role of both country mechanisms mandated by the Council the International Fact-Finding Mechanism acting within the 
OHCHR, and the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights Situation in Belarus. We appreciate the tireless work done by both mandate holders, including Ms. Anais Moren, who, who is present with us today. It is crucial that the work of Special Representative is extended by the Council at this present session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, now we're going to hear Ukraine speaking, followed by Estonia. Ukraine, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Excellencies, dear colleagues, allow me to start by thanking the panelists for their informative presentation and the permanent mission of Lithuania for organizing this important event. Ukraine is pleased to be among the traditional co-organizers of these discussions on Belarus, which have already become regular on the margins of the HRC sessions. I remember the last time a side event like this took place on the 23rd February, several hours before the world woke up into a new reality after Russia's full-scale invasion of my country. It is extremely sad for us that in addition to all the human rights trouble that accompanied Belarus, it has also become a springboard for this brutal and unjustified war on the people of Ukraine that has taken lives of thousands of our citizens and brought so much suffering to my country. Despite many empty promises that Belarus will never be part of such an attack, the regime in Minsk has become an accomplice in this barbarous crime. We are confident that there will be no escape to impunity, neither for these wrongdoings against the people of Ukraine, nor for those directed against the human rights of our neighbors in Belarus. We remain alarmed by the continuing reports of torture and other inhuman or degrading treatments persecution of journalists, opposition leaders, and human rights defenders in Belarus. Official Minsk has to return to compliance with its human rights obligations and to engage constructively with the Special Rapporteur and the OHCHR. To conclude, I wish to reiterate our support to the democratic aspiration of the people of Belarus and commitment to good neighborly relations with them based on respect to the rule of law and human rights. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Estonia, you will go next. Uh, and after that, uh, since we uh, have some time left, I would like to turn back to our panelists with some questions. But first, Estonia, you have the floor. Excellencies, dear colleagues, I would like to thank the Lithuanian mission um, which in cooperation with the NGOs, Pan America and the Human Rights House Foundation has organized this timely and very much needed side event. As we heard today, the overall situation of human rights in Belarus continues to deteriorate. The number of people convicted based on politically motivated charges is growing steadily. The use of unjustified violence by the authorities and the overall atmosphere of fear have led to the mass exodus of political opponents, human rights defenders, representatives of the free media, civil activists, intellectuals, and many ordinary people. As we heard, the authorities continue to restrict freedom, restrict freedom of expression, tightening the control of internet-based information sources, limiting access to independent media, arresting and imprisoning media workers. The new constitution approved um, in a so-called referendum in February is a significant step forward in restricting human rights and civil liberties in Belarus. The most drastic recent developments, uh, as we see, is the amendments to the country's criminal code entered into force on 29th of May that would make attempted acts of terrorism punishable by death. The number of cases in Belarus where the activity, activists accused of um, perpetrating acts of terrorism a charge that could now result in a death penalty. The deteriorating human rights situation in Belarus needs constant and high attention from international human rights organizations, as well as continuous and comprehensive monitoring. Close cooperation and exchange of information between the various institutions and monitoring missions, missions is essential, as is very important also um, prolonging of the mandate of special rapporteur at the session. Thank you. Thank you to all our co-sponsors uh, for your remarks. 
So dear panelists, I would like uh, to turn it back to you right now and ask you um, what recommendations you have to the Human Rights Council to be able to improve the situation uh, in Belarus. Um, Tasiana Nidbay, would you like to start? Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you deeply to the organizers of the event. I will probably be forced uh, to repeat what I have said and I would like you to focus on these things. Please keep Belarus in the focus of your attention. Do not abandon it. And of course, do not abandon uh, uh, the, the scope of uh, art and culture because culture is what is the basis for long-term democratic uh, changes. Without this basis, we won't be able, even in case uh, the Belarusian power is changed, uh, we won't be able to keep the democratic situation in the country. Over. Thank you, Ms. Nidbay. Um, Alek Aheyev, can you uh, yes. share your thoughts? Yes. I believe uh, that the UN Human Rights Council, as well as other human rights uh, mechanisms, uh, both uh, government and non-government international institutions, uh, should not lose focus on the human rights situation in Belarus, as Tatiana said. They should keep this on their agendas. Today, it is important to put all efforts In order to uh, in order to make those uh, who commit these uh, crimes against human rights and uh, humanity uh, to make them liable for what they do, today we have enough evidence proving massive crimes in Belarus and against Belarusians. These crimes have not been investigated in Belarus, and those guilty feel that they are innocent. And uh, then this uh, is translated into crisis, like the war that Russia started against Ukraine. Therefore, I urge all of you to put maximum efforts either to set up an international judicial procedure to make them liable or to expand and extend the mechanisms of universal jurisdiction uh, which is available in multiple countries to leverage these uh, mechanisms to make perpetrator, uh, perpetrators uh, liable for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aheyo, for your important remarks. Uh, Mr. Sapelka, uh, would you like to um, share your recommendations as well? In fact, my recommendations uh, have already been explained in my speech, and right now I would like to highlight the fact that I do support the words that uh, we should consistently and, uh, and uh, persistently support Uh, the extension of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur in Belarus, because this is critical for Belarus, and this is an important uh, tool to improve the situation with the human rights, if not to improve, then at least to monitor and identify serious violations that are taking place today. Thank you so much. Any uh, final concluding remarks? All right. Um, Can I briefly? Yes, please, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. And this is this is about sort of the recommendations and the next step uh, steps uh, without repeating myself. Uh, I would like to reinforce the point that was raised by Pavel Sapelka uh, that uh, democratic forces, civil society of Belarus need to have more presence in the United Nations in particular. Again, we, we can see that the regime, which is dictatorial, which is cruel and lawless, which has completely disregarded uh, international norms of behavior, international humanitarian law, 
they have the floor, they have the attention, they have all the tools uh, in their disposal uh, to speak on uh, about uh, their perspective and sort of defend their uh, their position, uh, we should have the same. Uh, the Russian people should have the same. Also, uh, to, uh, it is necessary to highlight the connection uh, between uh, the situation in Belarus, the meltdown of democratic institution and norms, and the events in Ukraine. Uh, this is directly connected. Uh, Lukashenko has, has become the co-aggressor. He is guilty of this war because uh, he uh, the, the situation in Belarus has not been addressed effectively. Uh, um, until the war started, uh, and also to reinforce the connection uh, between the of the future Belarus and Ukraine as democratic, independent, sovereign countries. Uh, I'm addressing you with these remarks at this event from Kiev, Ukraine, uh, where Svetlana Tsikhanovska uh, has established uh, representation specifically uh, to be with Ukrainian people, to work on the present issues, but also to work on the future, uh, to work on the post-war arrangements, how we can win the war, but also how we need to win the peace that is sustainable, that is democratic, that is uh, an insurance assurance uh, to the entire region that there will be no such wars in the future. Thank you, Mr. Kowalewski and all uh, our panelists, as well as all participants. I uh, now have my final remarks before concluding the event. As our speakers have clearly stated today, the issue of human rights in Belarus is of mounting significance. It is deserving of our utmost focus and attention. We are rapidly approaching the two-year anniversary of the rigged presidential election, and with that anniversary comes an obligation to acknowledge the drastic unraveling of Belarusian society that followed. The loss and relocation of so many civil society organizations, the unjust and politically motivated incarceration of so many, are only the most obvious consequences of what has been an exceptionally challenging time in Belarusian history. A year ago, my colleagues and I remarked on the importance of international solidarity with Belarusian civilians in order to prevent further breakdowns of human rights. An important aspect of this solidarity is the renewal of the mandate of Belarus on Belarus and an ongoing attentiveness to research provided by Special Rapporteur Anna Ismaha. The permanent mission of Lithuania, Pan America and the Human Rights House Foundation urge those from council member states to use their position to ensure the renewal of a mandate. In addition, as your delegations advocate on behalf of Belarusian civil society and human rights and demand accountability, I and my colleagues offer ourselves as a resource. Pan America and the Human Rights House Foundation can offer independent information on this topic on request as needed. Thank you to our panelists, to our co-sponsors, and to co-organizers at the, uh, the permanent mission of Lithuania, Pan America, and the Human Rights House Foundation. Thank you also to our interpreters and translators. Please enjoy the rest of Human Rights Council 50 and be well.